Are you a scaling SaaS founder? Ready to make the leap from leading a team to leading an organization? Join us each week as we refill your think tank with actionable tips and strategies from great business minds and those who don't know yet. This is SaaS Fuel with your host, five-time entrepreneur, SaaS founder, and globetrotting adventurer, Jeff Maines. Welcome back to the SaaS Fuel podcast, where our go-to-market strategy is like a suspense novel. Every chapter reveals a new twist, keeping competitors guessing and surrounding clients with value until we win. I'm your host, Jeff Maines. I hope B2B SaaS founders like you grow from traction to scale. Here, growth is more than just numbers. It's about crafting a future-proof company, premium valuation, and leaders who build a business of significance while living epic, adventurous lives. Executing a winning go-to-market strategy often feels like trying to solve a 5,000-piece jigsaw puzzle on the brown paper side with 100 pieces missing plus 200 pieces from six other puzzles thrown in. Can you relate to that? Over the last few months, I've had a dozen conversations with, with founders frustrated by this very thing. I mean, leaders are dealing with obstacles like unclear key performance metrics, muddled sales messages, and customer data scattered across systems and, and it never seems to match up. It makes it exceptionally difficult to track and optimize your go-to-market efforts. How do you know what levers to pull or what to adjust when you don't have a clear picture of what's really going on? We solve this by adopting a systematic approach and focusing on incremental improvements. Now we can't fix everything at once, but we certainly can over time, starting with the biggest impact items first. And on the upside, I mean, these are normal growing pains that we can overcome and tweak strategy using data-driven insights. And for clarity, go-to-market isn't the place we advertise or email sequences. It's not sales scripts or how the team is set up. It's not push, it's not pull, it's not sales or marketing. It's actually all of those things working together to support the overall go-to-market strategy. So the underlying strategy is, is sales and marketing, but go-to-market is what unifies those. Sales is about demand generation, qualifying leads, closing deals. Marketing generates awareness, educates the audience, nurtures leads, and determines messaging, branding, content, that kind of thing. And go-to-market is all of that under one umbrella, united by a single strategy. It establishes target profiles, end-to-end -end pipeline processes, what the mix of channels looks like based on product and buyer's needs. It's essentially, it's the glue between sales and marketing that sets common priorities for each. And so often sales is working really hard doing their thing and marketing is working really hard doing their thing. But success comes when we're together doing our thing. So what does that look like? Back to systematic approach and data-driven insights. Uh, first, we want to make sure that we do establish clear key performance metrics, clear KPIs. And one of the easiest ways to get started is getting a clear picture of what success actually looks like and charting a path to that. So here's where we want to go and what does it look like to get there? What are the steps we need to do? Start by defining the metrics that truly matter for each step of that process or channel, for example. So paid ads, you might focus on cost per lead or a click-through rate or a conversion rate. For sales, maybe it's lead to opportunity conversion, average contract value, or the days in a specific sales cycle stage. All of those provide intel into what's working, sometimes what's not working, and provide some clues as to what to try next. But the important part is that they're correlated to the overall go-to-market strategy, not isolated in themselves. I think we make a big mistake in trying to work on those things and, and we may have one isolated piece of data and we only focus on that, but it's just, it's a point solution. It's not in the overall context of the strategy. Second is to solve the data explosion. I mean, anybody else struggle with that? The data that you need is in five different places, multiple systems. And we've got to address the issue of siloed customer data by implementing some sort of an integrated system that provides a unified view of sales, marketing, support activities. Could be as simple as Zapier integration. So zaps back and forth between things. APIs could be a reporting dashboard that pulls disparate data into one place or you know, really complex. Maybe it's a data warehouse. Figure out the right solution for you. But ultimately the goal is to be able to attribute conversions accurately 
identify cross departmental opportunities for improvement, plus cross sell upsell opportunities. And that's huge. And those are all critical for maintaining high net dollar retention, which again, there's a key KPI for your business. But by breaking down these data silos, you'll be able to make better, more informed decisions and optimize your overall go to market strategy. A step three is to test incremental optimizations. And I love starting small. Does that sound weird? Making small changes and then we keep the winners. And it, the reason I like that is because it doesn't disrupt the business. And most of those small changes are easy to roll back. Not all of them, but most of them. But besides being low risk, small changes over time have a huge impact. So embrace a culture of experimentation by conducting low cost tests. Could be tweaking your messaging and paid ads or adjusting your content strategy, maybe testing out a new product or new product feature even before you build it. But before you build the product, build the habit of continually testing and iterating, and you'll be able to adapt to market changes and fine tune your approach based on what works best or what's most likely to work based on the data and the feedback you get. Go to market strategy will always have an element of frustration. I wish I could change that, but it's just the way that it is. Working through growth requires working through the growing pains that go with it. But focusing on a clear definition of success, getting sales and marketing aligned, and following and iterating on the feedback of data-led experiments, leaders can navigate the complexities of the market and steer their companies towards success. What's your greatest frustration with go-to-market strategy? Do you find it more or less challenging as you scale up? Let me know in the comments below. Our expert guest last week was Dan Belkowski, founder and chief pricing officer of Product Tranquility. Dan brought great perspective and new ways to think about pricing, especially how to price your SaaS right. And spoiler alert, it's not by copying your competitors. Great insights from Dan. And our founder last week was Derek Ray, CEO at Demand Inc. and Lasso AI. We talked about sales development, startup growth, and the evolving landscape of personalized messaging and AI. Great insights from a multi-time founder. If you missed either of those episodes, go back and give them a listen. My guest today is Wes Bush, the founder and CEO of Product Led. He's the best-selling author of Product Led Growth, How to Build a Product That Sells Itself. And he's also one of the most sought after product experts in the world. Really happy to have him here. After working on some of the world's fastest growing companies, today he trains teams around the globe how to turn their products into powerful growth engines. Welcome, Mr. Product Led Growth, Wes Bush. Hey, Wes, welcome to SaaS Fuel. Thanks for having me. You are the product-led growth guy, and that is a concept that has really revolutionized the way we approach SaaS growth. How did you come up with that? I mean, tell me the story behind it. Yeah, so I feel like I was doing product-led growth before it was called product-led growth. And so yeah. this is about eight years ago, I was working at these different B2B SaaS companies, and I was doing demand generation, digital marketing for these companies. And I was basically in charge of getting leads for their sales team. And so I was spending hundreds of thousands of dollars every month, basically promoting white papers and guides. Hey, here's the top report on how to build a video marketing strategy. And at the bottom, there would be like a demo request, like option. Hey, you want to learn how to do this at the highest level? Book a demo and we'll show you our software. And so it was surprising, but like that was working for the business. We were getting uh, a lot of people booking demos, but then I would always ask the sales team. I was like, hey, like, how are those leads uh, that I sent you? And did, were they really excited to like talk in? Did they know what we were and all that stuff? They're like, no, like <laughs> we really had to work hard <laughs> to get them on those calls after reading that guide. And so I was always just in the back of my head. I was like, is there a better way? And so about six months into my time at Vidyard, where I was working, we launched this free trial. I was like, oh yeah, this is what everybody else is doing in our space. So of course we'll pick 14 days. Sounds like a good amount of time to check out the product. Launched it, bombed. Didn't work. The only thing people were talking about was like, hey, that little free trial CTA, it's actually cannibalizing this business. Our sales motion oh, wow. working way better. So <laughs> how about we just kill that thing? Because it's getting in the way of us getting business. So sounds fair, right? So <laughs> yeah. 
they eventually like <laughs> silently hide this unsuccessful free trial. But lucky enough, about six months after that, we launched this free product, which was like a simple Chrome extension. And that actually took off. Like we were all shocked. We were like, oh, we had a hundred thousand plus people using that product first year. It's been used by millions now, but that was my first, like, ah, you know, I didn't spend like a ton of money marketing that it actually just shared. Uh, people started sharing videos. People started seeing those videos. They started being like, how do you do that? Wow. That was cool. I want to do that too. They started just like naturally gravitating towards this free product and it grew so much faster. And so that was my first foray into product-led growth. And then since then, I've just been consulting, helping companies uh, build these product-led growth motions for their business. Well, before it was product-led growth. And then when the term was coined by OpenView, I was like, oh, that's it. That is it. <laughs> that's what this me. is. <laughs> I do that thing. <laughs> that's me. <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah, I've seen a lot of companies that have been sales-led, a lot of product-led. Both have been very successful. Uh, but crossing over seems to be a, a difficult thing for either side. Uh, what companies have you seen product-led work really well for? And what companies maybe does it not work as well for? Yeah, so maybe I'll take this from a different approach I haven't in the past. But I think a lot of it comes down to core values, too. What does the company value? What problems do they solve? So a company that solves for simplicity, that doesn't necessarily mean they don't necessarily do complex things. But one of the biggest things I believe is it comes down to their core values. So a lot of times the product led companies, they focus a lot on, we're going to make X, whatever we do easier, whiteboarding easier, video communication frictionless. There we go. That's Zoom. That's Miro. Like all the companies are like, we make this stuff easy and we make it simple to do it all that stuff. Now, great enterprise sales like companies, they are masters at solving the most complex problems. So I was talking to VMware and we were going through like PLG, how to implement the business. And I remember getting this like <laughs> really smart guys. I don't see how this can work in this area. He's like, our salespeople, what they're doing is very hard to do. Like they interact like these three, four, five custom solutions. They present it as this is your custom solution to solving your big expensive problems to other organizations. And I'm like, and they're like this data, it's like a heart surgery thing. You don't really want to mess with it because the whole business could go down if you don't do this right. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you still need sales. Okay. <laughs> like, let's not automate that <laughs> away, please. Because you're solving for complexity and doing it a fantastic job at it. So I think yeah. if you were to boil this down to one thing, it really is that. Are you going to make something a hell of a lot easier for somebody, which is like making it, democratizing it for everybody? Pro product led, yes. If you're solving something for like very complex, big challenges for big enterprises, it's like you probably need that sales head motion. Now they can interact and, and stuff like that too, but I'm just painting the, <laughs> the spectrums for everybody. <laughs> Which makes a lot of sense. If it's something that is not familiar or if it's complex or if it solves five different problems, maybe more sales led where if, yes. it's, if it's very simple, there's a straight path through you know, point A to B make, I, I like that analogy, just making things simple. Totally. And the you'll find that but it's not just from the product standpoint. It's also who do you target? Like the best product that companies a lot of times are like single point solutions. Not all the case, like you can create the hub spot that has like a product in motion and go through that. But like sure. it, they have a lot of sales coming in from their Salesforce too, because of the complexity, you go to their pricing page, you're like, what? It's just, right. it's complex. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, without a doubt. And so there, there's definitely a place for both. Where do companies fall down when it comes to product-led? Yes. So this kind of goes into the like product-led system we're working on. With the very first step, like there's nine kind of core steps if you want to, to become product-led and scale it up. The first one where I see most people don't even think about it uh, is just the overall vision and strategy of the business. So Whenever a company is stuck in this indecision of should we become product led or should we not, it's almost always because they don't have a really great vision. A lot of times when I ask them for the companies that are unclear about this, what's your vision? So, we want to be a $10 million business by X date. I'm like, great. <laughs> Tell me all the ways you can get there with that vision. And they're like, right. oh, we could do that. Right. We could do that. And they're like, that's the problem. 
is. <laughs> right, right. There's a million ways to do it. That's not a vision. That's somewhere you want to get to. Yeah. But not how. Exactly. Like when I look at like Camp as a web page, or as we want to <laughs> enable anybody to design anything, I'm like, okay, that's right. pretty powerful, provocative. <laughs> now, what's the best way to do that? It's like having a big sales <laughs> manually teaching everybody in the world to do this. It's like, that's just not going to work. It's There's no way that business model would ever work. But could a product-led self-serve motion that makes it extremely easy to design and everything else, could that help that vision become true? As without a doubt, right? So that vision makes a ton of sense and that strategy should just reinforce it because then it's, well, what capabilities do we need to actually do that really well? And it's, well, let's pick two or three. Great user experience. Okay, great. We have to have that and be really good at that. Whereas for a sales a company, it might be like the customized solution space where you got to solve these really complex solutions. We do this better than anybody else. Like there's, you can skin a cat many ways, but it comes down to what is your vision sure. and your strategy that backs it up. Oh, that's really good. What are the other steps? You said there are nine, nine steps and that yeah. was the first one. Tell us more. Yeah, for sure. So the first one is, are you clear on your vision and strategy? The second is all about, are you very clear on who's your ideal user? And so in a sales company, a lot of times it's, okay, we all heard like ICP, ideal customer profile, who's your ideal buyer, everything else like that. That's still good to know. But for a product-led company, you really have to understand your ideal user. That's not always the buyer. In an ideal world, it is. True. Uh, if you're checking out chess.com, you're like, I like playing chess. And then you, you sign up, you're like, you're the user and the buyer. How great. Uh, right. Business to consumer apps are fun like that. But B2B apps that are adapting product-led growth, that's where you get, okay, it's a bit different. But understanding that user is paramount to really making this motion work because if you don't know who you're serving chances are you're not going to have raving fans where they're like oh, i love your app oh my goodness what would i do without this app you want to have those people who get it and i'll give you an example yeah. one of our clients in our program they were like a testimonial social sharing like applications so they made it easy to collect testimonials share them on your website all that stuff so we listed out like their top three and one of them was like SaaS folks and the other one was like course creators. And so we like took them through like this, like how motivated are they? How willing are they to succeed and everything else like that? Like as far as like their tech ability to like actually use the app and all that stuff. And so what's interesting about it, and this will apply to, to your audience as well, where it's like your best ideal user with what your product is right now, today, they already love it for what it is. So when we ask the SaaS founders in our group, they're like, I don't like your app. Like I could just use G2. I need to like all these other bells and whistles. They're like, okay, I'm not choosing those people. Course creators are like, we have this. They're like, will you have that? Oh my goodness, here's my money. And so I think it's something so simple, but it's like when you have that clarity on an ideal user, it just makes like finding that customer a lot easier. They're more excited to be with you. And it just makes it way easier to win those customers. So that's the second step of understanding that user and then their ideal user journey. That's a, a real fundamental difference. One, the difference between the buyer and the user and, and making that distinction and then really finding who your ideal prospect is, that yeah. true ICP instead of who you want it to be. For sure. Yeah, and I think a lot of times it's easy for founders to like pick whatever they're most comfortable with, but it's, that's not always right. who that is. And maybe sometimes it is, but uh, a lot of times it's not. And that's, oh, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> so what about step three? Yeah, so once you know who your ideal user is, the kind of third step is really crafting your ideal model. So what do you decide to actually give away for free? I'll tell you, one of the most common articles on our website is like free trial versus freemium. And I'll pick on that example because I'm like, you're asking the wrong question. <laughs> the sticky ah. review there is it doesn't matter one bit what that model is. What really matters is once you identify like that ideal user, you basically chop their life into three phases. They're like the beginner life, the intermediate life, the advanced life. And it's like the beginner life is the user, they're a rookie, what they're doing, they don't understand uh, much about what you do in your products. But what is that big, meaningful milestone that like they could accomplish where they would truly feel like, wow, that was a fantastic product experience. I got some great value from it. So you basically pick that milestone 
and you just reverse engineer. Okay, what do we need to give away for free to actually help them out and get to that point where they're like, wow, I love this app. I want more of it. And so that's the fun part where you can, it's like, oh, Charlie wants this for Christmas. What do we give him? <laughs> It becomes a lot easier, right? It's like we give up what Charlie <laughs> exactly. Wants. Not always, but like we give him enough where he feels happy. Maybe not the Camaro, but we'll give him the toy car. Um, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> no, that, that's really good. Just thinking that through, and I think a lot of times we look at it and just do get stuck on that. Well, I don't know, freemium or free trial. Yeah, but uh, taking it that step further, and what do we need to give them? How do we lead them through? And it really, it's, it's the buyer journey. Totally. And how do we take them one step at a time to the, the logical conclusion of I have to have this solution? This is awesome. Yeah, and what's fun when you do that user component is you identify what are some of those core kind of big questions they have to unlock before they can move to the next level. Like for us at Product Lead, like it's very early stage, like beginner, beginner. People are asking like, what is PLG? And I was like, okay, you, you got to know about that before you remotely even want to work with us. Okay, great. So you got to understand yeah. that. <laughs> oh, is PLG <laughs> right for me? And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, we got to give that away for free too, right? <laughs> because once again, you're not really going to value what we do until you get that like understanding. It's like, oh, and then what's right. the best way to do this? And I was like, okay, this is like the non-step thing that we're talking about right now. It's like, okay, great. Still not going to charge you for that because... It just doesn't make sense. It's, oh, who's the best person to do this? Hopefully by now we know each other. <laughs> so yeah, just thinking through those kind of logic questions in every product, the fun part is like, how do we understand what those are? And it gives you this like next level Jedi like trick where I understand you so well. And chances are you want to yeah. like work together because I get you. And that's exactly right. I mean, you really get inside the the mind of your ideal prospect and, and they, they really think that you're reading their mind. Totally. It's just because you've done this so many times, you've mapped out that journey. What are they going to want to know next and the next? Yeah, definitely. It's a very cool thing. So how about uh, step four? Yes. So like the first part, one thing I'll touch on before I get to step four is the first three are like, those are just your foundation blocks. So that's everything to get this set up, right? Don't do anything else <laughs> before you do those first three, but everything has like <laughs> order. So it's, if your vision's weak, start there. If you got a great vision strategy and your user is like really low, it's yes, yeah, start there. So everything builds off of each other. So the fourth one, this is really where we look at like your offer. So do you actually have like irresistible offer for your business? And so a lot of times, like the question I always ask companies to understand where they stand on this is, okay, how are you five to 10 times better than the competition? And so if it's not, oh, we are like this, you probably don't have an irresistible offer because if you're not convinced why you're five to 10 times better, your copy on your website is definitely not yeah. communicating that. Like definitely, there is no way it is. And your customers, when I ask them the same question, they're going to be like, I don't know. And so that's, well, how do you stand out? Why are you better? And so a lot of times when it comes to irresistible offer, it has nothing to do with the copy. Like in our program, we work with founders and <laughs> they're not usually the best copywriters. And I mean, sometimes they are, but sure. most times not. So when we go through the like strategy component, I'll give you an example. One of the companies are called Promotex. They're like going up against Eventbrite. So like in the event ticketing space. And so in that strategy, we basically said two things. We're better because we're cheaper, 20 to 30% cheaper. Three, uh, the second reason is we actually have marketing tools that enable you to sell more tickets. That's it. And on their offer page, that's all they leaned into. Didn't really change wow. too much else. Leaned into that. They saw 47% more people signing up for their free trial. Why was that? It's an irresistible offer. It was irrefutable. These are the main solid facts. And they actually called like Eventbrite out. Like they are collaborating you with fees and like <laughs> really picking a villain. <laughs> and so I, I think that really leans into building that irresistible offer is you got to have a sticky point of view. You got to have a good reason why people should choose you versus somebody else. And especially when you got big gorilla like competition, why not pick up a fight against them? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's really smart. And what about the, the next step? Yeah. So once you get your offer locked down, odds are you have people that are like super motivated. They understand what your, your product is all about, that promise. But once again, that promise should connect back to what is that beginner milestone that you're promising people you're going to actually deliver on? Because this part, step five, is where you actually have to deliver on it. So if you overpromise them, 
odds are this won't work out well for you. If you promised them 90% of it and now you're going to deliver on the 100%, this is good on you. It's going to work really well. So the next step is all about onboarding. And so the framework we use here is we call it like the bowling alley framework. And so what we do at that's this stage, if you ever played bowling, it's there's like that middle line where it's like super straight. And then your odds of getting most pins down are like the highest if you go down the middle. So right. what we do in your product is we basically create a straight line. So like we go through with the best people in your company that understand your product the best. We say, okay, how can you get people to this like beginner milestone as soon as humanly possible? Like minimum number of steps. And so we craft out what that looks like. We kill uh, so many of these steps. So literally I did this on Monday with uh, one of our one-on-one clients. They had 71 steps to get to that first beginner milestone. <laughs> and that happens a lot. Yeah. It was pretty and crazy. So many companies do that. And, I made and sure it's the onboarding. I'm like you got to see how painful this is. And <laughs> so guess how many steps they got it down to? 10. Eight. Yeah. So it was just Oh, like, wow. And it's not hard. <laughs> the overall steps they have to do to get values, it's actually pretty straightforward. So it's like you build your straight line. That's step one. And then you put up the bumpers because you want every advantage. Like whenever, like bowling actually had this history. I don't know if much about the history of bowling, but they realized like early days why it wasn't taking off. It was because there was a big learning curve. Like a lot of beginners, especially small kids, other family members are like, hey, I can't really get into it. Sure, Tommy's great at it, but I suck at bowling. I'm not coming back. I just got humiliated. Right. So they like they found out there was a way to level the playing field, hence bumpers. And so you can do the same thing in your product. People just don't think about it this way, where it's like you have a product bumper, which is like how you guide people through the app. You can put those up to literally be like, I'm going to take you through those eight steps, exactly what you need to do to get to that first milestone. And I'm going to be your guide. I'm not always going to be here, but I'm going to guide you through this first one. Would that be okay? Everybody's going to say, yeah, please. <laughs> I don't understand your game. Yeah. And then the, the other bumper is your conversational bumper, which is now wherever you dropped off, I'm going to follow up wherever you got. So if you got to step four, I'm going to follow up with, hey, here's how to get to step five. Oh, you've, you got stuck at step five. Okay, great. Like here's how to get stuck at, <laughs> not get stuck, <laughs> complete step six. <laughs> and so you just go through each of those steps with them and whichever one you realize most people are following down on, you can do different things like, oh, let's offer them a pop-up. If they get stuck on step four, everybody gets stuck on step four. Let's just say, hey, we can do that for you. Would you be okay? We'll book a quick call and we'll get it set up for you. Would that be fine? So like the experience component is all about how do we get like 50 to 90% of people who sign up to actual value in your product? And so when you go through that bowling alley framework, what's so cool about it is you just manufacture successful users. It takes a lot of work, but that's the whole reason why product-led growth does work. <laughs> I got your value. You didn't have to tell me about it. You just showed me. So that's why it's a super important component. If you want to better align your go-to-market strategy and your team performance, a great way is scorecards and KPIs. Of course, the old way was either expensive to automate or manually done in time-sucking spreadsheets. Nobody likes that. Well, Champion Leadership Group brought that into the 21st century with a SaaS solution that is incredibly powerful and currently free. If you would like a SaaS operating system designed to make your business world-class, along with on-demand fractional C-suite team, plus a community of scaling founders, check out Champion Leadership Group. If you're stuck at your current revenue level, this is for you. If you feel like the world's best kept secret, we've got your back. And if you're crushing it already and know your company has another gear, this is definitely for you, especially if you're busy. And I hear that all the time. Oh man, I'm so busy. I can't do it. Of course you can. Now is the time to upgrade from traction to scale. You'll gain access to a fractional C-suite team, a community of scaling SaaS founders, and the SaaS fuel operating system, no spreadsheets. It's built into software to make your business world-class, align your team around your go-to-market, and support a premium valuation. You can learn more at championleadership.com. It's where leaders evolve and companies transform. That absolutely is. I mean, the onboarding process in, in so many, I've seen lots and lots of product-led growth probably not as many as you, but just as a, a user going through, it's, is this ever going to end? And you get started and get in and, and 71 steps. I may get on a good day, yep. maybe 10 or 15 on a bad day, four or five. And then it's, I'll get back to that later. And, and I never do. Yeah. 
because so, that's like yeah, it's getting, getting that win. <laughs> yeah. 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 We, we want that dopamine hit. We want, uh, we, we went there and got a product because we need to solve a problem. We want to get that thing solved, whatever it is, mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. It's, it's something I think a lot of companies miss, but maybe it's because they think they need to show all these things to show the, yeah. the breadth and depth of the value instead of solution. They forget why people are really there. Yeah, oh, it's easy to miss because we think it's like, oh, you're here because everything we do. And that's actually, you're probably here because <laughs> you just had this one problem, right? And if we solve that, like maybe you find the other stuff interesting, you probably would. But let's start with helping you first. <laughs> Instead of the doctor being like, hey, look at we have the sleep ward, we have the heart surgery ward. It's like, I can't breathe. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> can you help yeah, me? How about we fix that and then we'll move on to other things? Yeah. Yeah, so, getting that quick win. Totally. So important. Definitely. So what's next after that? All right. So the last kind of part or component of this phase, which is all about like, how can you build a product that sells itself? This one is all about pricing. So how do you actually make it really easy for people to sign up, pull out their credit card, pay, self-serve? And so what we've identified is you really got to get crystal clear on what are those value metrics for your business. So how do you charge is really important. So is it most people will do per user? And I was like, <laughs> does the value in your product originate from more users or not? Most SaaS applications, mm, that's it's good. not the case. It's, oh, if you're Stripe, it's percentage of revenue. Great. That's a great relationship. Right. I mean, I wish every company could have that, but it's not possible. A lot of times it's more like a functional kind of value metric, which might be something like charging per contact, like HubSpot or ActiveCampaign or like literally any email marketing platform, they all adopt them. And so that's really an interesting way where you like get very specific on that outcome. They're going to give away for people, let them understand like how much am I going to get charged in like less than five seconds, they should be able to find what is the right plan for me? How much am I going to get charged? Do I have complete confidence in this? And okay, that seems great. You've handled my objections. And just going through that part in the pricing component is like really straightforward because a lot of sales and companies, they struggle at this step because they're like, oh yeah, we hit the pricing for years. Now, what are the competitors going to think? Is this like a competitive price or not? We don't know. So there is a bit of willingness to pay kind of stuff we do if you haven't tested it and stuff like that too, that goes into it. But yeah, that's the pricing component to really get that self-serve sale. But yeah, that's phase two out of three. And so how should they be thinking about setting those prices? I mean, I like that, the value metric. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But, you know, if I look at a CRM and they're going to charge me per contact, do I really want to do that or would I rather pay per seat? I don't know. It goes either way. So how do you advise clients to think about that and setting pricing and, and what that value metric is? Yeah. So with the like size of companies we typically work with, this is going to be so bad, but <laughs> for early stage companies, you do guess. And that is <laughs> the way you typically guess. Like for some of these metrics, you will look like if you're in a competitive space, let's say email marketing in that case, everybody's doing per contact. Now, if your strategy is, let's say we don't do that. We're like the base camp of our space. We are like unlimited number of users for only 99 bucks a month. How great. So you could do that and be like, screw that. We're, this is part of our strategy. This is how we're going to win. This is what differentiates our product. So if that's your play, it's power to you. You could still build a really crazy successful business. I love <laughs> base camps, profit numbers. You could do well there. <laughs> and so that's one option. The other option is you start to look at, okay, what actually makes sense? So for instance, whenever I was working with a client just going through this, they basically took all the messages from like Walmart, Amazon, and they like just routed it to a help desk. So it was actually easy to like filter through, collaborate with people and all that fun stuff. So like we just said, now, what would be a function of value that people could understand that would make a lot of sense for this kind of business? So we said... How about per message? That's the unit of economic value that's like being translated here. So, okay, if you got 10,000 messages, it's this price. If you have 20,000, it's this price. Now, there is some disadvantages sometimes creating these new metrics where it's like, 
how much am I going to get charged? What is that going to look like? And so you do have to address some of those things and make it really easy to understand some of those pieces. But generally at that level, you're going to just take your best bet and you can get people to stack rank them in a survey of, okay, sort these by which one makes the most sense for you. And we do recommend that for like companies that are doing at least three mil plus for, okay, there, there is some serious things going on here. You have generally more product market fit than a company that's like sub 1 million where I'm like, just do it. Learn fast because you will not get that statistical yeah. significance. Most likely you're just going to have to fly a bit more blind. So you get a bit more volume to, to understand this. That makes a lot of sense. We did that in, in my SaaS company 10 years ago. We we're going in enterprise SaaS sales led and going up against competitors that were all price per seat. Yeah. And so we started price. We did usage based pricing. Nice. And so they're comparing us and they're looking and they had to talk to us because they're yeah. looking at seat pricing and ours is zero unlimited users, unlimited everything. And they're like, what, How do wait you make a second, money? <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, what is this? And so, but it, it made people start having conversations with the sales team and that's growth really took off, but our goals were aligned. And I think that's mm -hmm. the, really uh, an important piece is that value metric totally, and, and making sure that the goals are aligned because when, when they were doing better, we were doing better. And yeah. so that's, and we've kept that for years. Yeah. And I think like you nailed it on the head too, where it's like, what is really important in pricing? Take all the, the mumbo jumbo talk about value metrics and everything else out of this and be like, if you get one first principle right here is as you charge more, you should make sure your customer is getting a lot more value too. If you can find that relationship, that symbiotic yeah. relationship of, oh, you got more value. Okay, great. Here's we're going to charge a little bit more too. That symbiotic relationship is the, the really big piece where it's like, okay, remember that first principle, <laughs> figure out the rest that supports that, <laughs> the reverse engineering with the model, that'll work great. Yeah, yeah. And just thinking about that, I mean, competitors' bills were 15 pages long and we made it one single number. Yeah. And that was the usage-based metric and that was it. it. All they had to think about was one single number. So just that understanding of being able to move forward and yeah, that's it. Simplified. Totally. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So what's next? Yes. So the kind of third and final kind of phase, next three components are all about how do you actually just scale this up? So the first one that was about like your foundation, get that ready. That's your overall strategy of building your product led motion. The second one is all about your go to market motion. How do you build the product that sells itself? The last one scaling all up. So the first kind of component of this set is all about data. So what are the biggest bottlenecks in your business? So as soon as you set everything mm -hmm. up, what yeah. does that look like? And what I find is a lot of founders do at this stage is they just overcomplicate it where it's like, oh yeah, let, let's track that too. We've got a new <laughs> new tool, product analytics. We got, oh wow, we got segment. Oh, we got so many tools. And they're like, we have so many things we're tracking. And of course, because you're tracking everything, you're typically not focusing on what is like the, the core drivers or the bottlenecks. Mm. Uh, sometimes you That's are, really good. but a lot of times you aren't. And so we just like, yeah. we simplify this to six kind of core metrics where it's okay, track this for your go-to-market motion. And this will make things so much easier in your business. Just understand how are users flowing through your value funnel? Because it's not like a conversion funnel where it's, okay, people move from demo to closed one kind of deal. This is like literally, literally look, okay, how many of these users got value? How many of them got what our product's all about? You got to track those specific pieces and see 10% of people actually understand the value prop. <laughs> Did 50 or 100? What does that look like? And making sure your team is actually accountable to some of those metrics. And so that's really what the data component is all about, like understanding those six to eight core metrics and just understanding, like having that right accountability to make sure that we're really focusing on the right area of the business. Oh, that's so good. It, it, you're right. I mean, it's so easy to track a ton of things. Yeah. And then we've got all this data and don't make any decisions with any of it. Right. Just we got lots of stuff. But yeah. uh, I, I like that focus. It's really smart. Cool. And yeah. so what's the next step? Yes. So number eight. So once you actually have that data, you're like, okay, this is our biggest bottleneck. Let's say in a company for most people listening here, I already know what it is. <laughs> so it's from after they sign up for your free product to set up. 
So that's next stage where it's okay. They're going through the little process. They got to put in a bit of investment to actually see the value that comes after this. That's where you're going to be losing 40 to 60% of people. And you probably, if you don't track those kind of six core metrics, you don't know which is where you should start because it's a really big opportunity. So once you find that the process component is all about, okay, how do we understand, launch more high impact experiments to tackle this. So once you find and identify, okay, this is the root issue, what we go through that's a bit different is we generate a ton of potential solutions, like not just one, we generate like anywhere from 10 to 30 potential solutions that range from anything from content, product related, resource related. And so we generate a ton of different potential solutions. And then we really go through which ones will actually have the highest impact, which ones will be easiest for us to launch. And then we launch target experiments every single, every seven days uh, to really fix that core bottleneck as fast as possible. And what's different about it is we also target it where it's, it's not just one team focusing on this, it's the entire team focusing on tackling this bottleneck. And so what that actually does is it solves your bottleneck really fast. And so yeah. because you align everybody and like, this is a big bottleneck, we got to solve from every single direction we could. This is what gets solved really quickly. And so that's the process component. It's really fun when we install it in companies because a lot of times it's, oh, the founder had a great idea and we installed that and it didn't work. And it's no, we involved <laughs> everybody. <laughs> we got the best of the best ideas and we killed 95% of them, how depressing, but the 5% we did launch, we gave it our all. They were the highest impact ones. I had the best chance of success and we unlocked a ton of creativity in the company. We solved this bottleneck very quickly and moved on to the next one. So that's really what the, the process component's all about. Yeah. That activation is a huge issue. So you get the sign up and then nothing yeah. happens. And do you think that, is that a function of just having too many steps or too complicated? Yeah. So like back that to is? that 101 client example, where there were 71 plus steps. It wasn't that they were trying to make it overly complicated. It's just nobody was really thinking about this and like how important it was to the overall success of a product led business. So a lot of times companies will go through this, they'll launch a free trial, a freemium model, and they'll be like, okay, we're doing product led. And I always go back to the first principle of product-led growth. I'm like, what makes a product-led business successful? And it all comes down to this one liner, which is like your user's success will eventually become your success. So mm -hmm. if they don't yeah. get that first piece, which is like, oh yeah, our users aren't that successful. They're clearly not getting value. They're getting stuck on step five, never mind 71. Yeah, they're not going to see the value of it. And so once we solve that, it unlocks the actual product led motion where it's like now people get it, they want upgrade for it, and it's the right stage for them to do it. Oh, that's good. So we've got the team together, you've got the process in place, you got the ideas, and then what is the final step? Yes. So the final step for product led companies is team. So why it's last is because I believe in a product led company, you can hire as a last resort. Because if you go through that mm -hmm. wheel where we go through identifying the biggest bottleneck, we launch a lot of experiments to solve those bottlenecks, like for setup as an example. We could have solved, let's say with that setup example, oh, let's hire like five customer success specialists <laughs> and scale up that way. So it could work, but it probably we wouldn't have actually gone through the filter that we had. Is it the easiest, least expensive way to solve this problem? Yeah. And it's because of the process in place, we actually just solved. We 10X the number of users going through our value funnel and we still have actually more empowered, better users out of this outcome. And so once what usually happens at this stage is you have your go-to-market motion, it's working relatively well. Like you have a good amount of signups turning into people who get value out of the products, good amount of those people turn into paying customers and they're sticky and all that. So once you get to that point, it's like, how do we pour more fire onto this? And so you might realize, okay, great. Like we're only getting like 200 plus signups a month, let's say consistently. Like how do we 10 X that as well? Okay. Maybe we need to hire like a marketing specialist or something in a specific channel to, to actually maximize this and build this up. Or maybe the person who's leading like our onboarding, they're okay at their job, but this is looking at the, the capabilities we need to have in this business. We need to be world-class at onboarding 
and really user customer experience. And so we might just need to say, okay, maybe they're going to take a bit more of a backseat on that team and we need to hire the right leader for this space. And so when you build your go-to-market motion this way, you get a lot less of those false <laughs> positive hires who are like, oh yeah, we're going to move fast. We're going to hire that CMO and <laughs> drop them in and then they right. turn and burn in three months. <laughs> they're like, yeah, I've seen that before. Or, oh, we're going to skip the, all these steps and just hire the CRO to do this. Oh, it's, I haven't seen that work really well either because they're going into like a... <laughs> a storm where all the pieces are out of order. There's not something that's consistently working. And so when you hire as a last resort, you actually put the people in, where right? you have the most leverage and they have the best odds of actually succeeding and getting the, the best value for you in your business. That's such a, a great analogy there. And just walking in all the, the pieces. It's, it is really smart, and that's very counter to where SaaS has been the, the last few years. Maybe it's a little more sanity over the last year. Totally. But it's, it's all it's been about throwing people at problems, and that's always the, the solution. And I like that that's last and making sure that process is in place first uh, instead of going to, to the hiring first. Because you know, what you're saying there, it, it doesn't scale. Totally. You know, if you go hire five people for, to solve this problem every time, well, you're going to have a scale problem eventually. But when you go and, and you look for the, the fastest, lowest cost solution, true solution to the problem when you're solving it, yep. then uh, you know, you're finding something that really does scale. And then humans are always a piece of it, but uh, not the first piece. Yeah. So and I really I, like the order there. That's the piece too. Like we recently had somebody from Israel reach out. He's, you know what? Like this has been a crazy month with everything going on and all that stuff. Like we are down 60% of our staff, but... I just wanted to tell you, Wes, this has been our best month ever. And here's why. It's because the product is the machine. It's not the people mm. in this company. Because we're product-led, the business is actually thriving despite the craziness of the situation, all that stuff. And regardless of whatever that situation is, is I think that's the key takeaway when you go more product-led. It's like you are building the machine and you're solving like 90% of those problems with the product. And so I think that adds to just the efficiency of the product led business too. Yeah. What is one myth around product led growth that, that you would like to, to dispel? Yes. There may be a commonly held belief that just didn't true. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I think the biggest one is it's anti-sales. Like you can't have sales in product led and mm. That's I don't good. know if I'm like guilty for portraying this, like my subtitle of the book, I was like, <laughs> how can I make it like, really provocative? It's like how to build a product that sells itself. And although I still believe that product growth, you do need that. You need to have a product that can sell itself. Um, there is very much so room for sales. It's just where do you add them into this process? Back to that VMware example, it's like that salesperson, high value like completely yeah. brilliant orchestration of going through all these pieces and merging them with this like beautiful custom solution. Amazing. I've also been like approached by a lot of like technical support sales specialists in product that experiences where it's really hard for me to do something. And they know it's hard because they look at their stats, those six core metrics. And then whenever I'm stuck, they, they reach out and say, hey, can we help you with that? Can we just set up that data metric to help you out? And I'm like, yeah, actually you could <laughs> because I am not that good at that <laughs> and I could use a hand. And so I think we're going to see a lot more of that evolution of like where does sales support success all kind of blend together. And we're going to have a lot more kind of like low touch sales as well as still enterprise sales. That's not going anywhere else, but really beautiful blend of there's still aligns with getting me to success. But because of that, I still upgrade more. Oh, that's good. In your book, you mentioned the importance of continuously iterating and improving their product experience. Um, what is the best way for companies to get that feedback and keep that loop going so that the product experience, implementation, onboarding, activation, all of that keeps getting better and better? Yeah. So in the user component, what we do is we broke down like the uh, user journey into these like 12 main stages. And so whatever kind of like notes or feedback comes in, we always just go in and say, okay, let's say for instance, with the sign of experience, like users are complaining that it's, it's really bad. Or we look at our stats and like Google analytics or something like that. And we're like, okay, shoot, we have a 1% conversion rate. So we got like qualitative, quantitative stuff. We're all bringing in for that one stage. 
And what we then do is like when it comes to just improving, we just go through that, triage it, go through, okay, this is actually the stuff that is the biggest, presents the biggest challenge. And we actually score, this is fun <laughs> with like earthquakes and stuff. They have like the Richard scale. We have something yeah. like that where it's, okay, this is on the like scale of challenge for your user. This is like a big, gigantic earthquake. And so we need to remove this for people. And so some, oh, it's a simple navigation, like let's just fix that, whatever. It doesn't really make a big difference, but it is important to score some of these things because they're not all created equal. Oh, that's a small challenge or a big challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And I think as software people, we look at our own solutions and we think, oh, it's easy, but because we live in the software and we do it all the time, but somebody brand new coming in may not see it that same way. Totally. Yeah. Well, where can people learn more about you and about product led growth online? Yeah, no, definitely. So if you're keen to like learn more about the system, just head on over to productlight.com. We have like free training. The actual entire system's free. That's our free motion. Don't tell anybody, okay? <laughs> 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 and then if you want to follow me on LinkedIn or just let me know if you found any useful insights from this podcast interview, hit me up, Wes Bush on LinkedIn, and I share daily updates on PLG. And really good content on LinkedIn. And the book is absolutely fantastic. Product-led growth, how to build a product that sells itself. Everybody should grab a copy of that. It is a well worth your time. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me on, Jeff. Absolutely. Thanks for being on SAS Fuel. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks again, Wes, for coming on the show and sharing your insights and resources. You can learn more about Wes and everything related to product-led growth at productled.com. You can also connect with Wes and I at SAS Open in just a few weeks. All links, highlights, resources, and full show notes are available at sasfuel.com. And be sure to check out the show on YouTube as well, which also has training, shorts, outtakes, and more. If you've enjoyed this journey with us, share this episode with a fellow explorer, and let's expand the adventure squad. Everyone who shares this week gets a go-to-marketing grappling hook. It's not just for scaling walls. It helps you latch onto the best market opportunities and pull yourself to the top. Brought to you by Wayne Industries. There you go, a little Batman reference for you. Well, join us Thursday on our SaaS Fuel Expert Series, where my guest is Morgan McCoy to talk about compensation, negotiating goals, reviews, and leading a high-performing team well. And next Tuesday, we have founder Derek Osgood a former marketing exec turned founder and CEO of Ignition, the collaborative go-to-market platform helping product and marketing teams get new products to market faster and more effectively. So I will see you next week. And as always, enjoy the journey. Thanks for listening to SaaS Fuel. Full show notes for each episode, which includes a summary, key takeaways, quotes, and any resources mentioned are available at sasfuel.com. Be sure to follow and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're enjoying the content and getting value from these episodes, please leave us a rating and review at ratethispodcast.com slash sassfuel. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes. Let's go!